Today we're going to be reviewing something truly massive, and that's the Creality CRM4. Now this thing is huge. It's got a 450 by 450 print area, which is obviously very large, but it's a big old bed slinger, so it's basically the world's largest Ender 3. So let's open this thing up and see how it prints. Now I have to review this thing on the floor of my office because none of my tables are big enough to house this beast. We got our spare parts and tools. Here's our X gantry assembly. And here is the base of the machine. Here's our print surface. We've got dual linear rails here and we've got dual belts to help move this bed around. This bed looks like it slides around a little bit. It looks like some of these screws might have worked themselves loose in the shipping process. So we'll just tighten them up. All right, now that all of those have been tightened up, this thing is rock solid. No play at all in this whole axis. And that's probably why they went with this dual linear rail setup. But if we look at it from underneath, you can see they've got dual bearing blocks on here just to further increase the rigidity of this axis. Now we're gonna flip this thing on its side and install the gantry and then snap this cable belt into position. Then we'll do the same for the x-axis. Then plug in this 24-pin sprite connector. And for all of you motherboard fan lovers out there, it looks like this will be compatible with the motherboard. And then we'll plug this screen in. I'm not sure how to adjust the tension of this little belt in the back, but it seems like it's making some kind of biting or scratching noise as the y-axis is moving back and forth. I'm gonna put some liquid-based wax lube on that belt. Well, now that's quieter. This spool holder just goes on on the top here. These V-Groove wheels really aren't what I'd consider to be a professional grade solution. If you wanna get these wheels properly tensioned, it's like a 10-step process. You need to have this block on its own tensioned and then tension this block also on its own and then attach a crossbar that locks them into that proper orientation. Then move it to the top, assemble this top gantry, then move this down to the bottom and tighten these bolts on the bottom. So really it's like a 10 or 12 step process that I doubt anyone's gonna actually go through. So as a result, these mechanisms are never really gonna work as well as they should. Really, Creality needs to come up with a procedure that you can go through to get these tensioned correctly because as it is, most of their machines out of the factory don't have properly tensioned V-Groove wheels. So that's definitely a manufacturing process that they could try and improve things. All right, and then we'll get these rods installed on the side here. So now I'm gonna go in and just tension these lock nuts. This should get rid of any kind of uh, slop in the system and make it much more stiff. So I just fired the machine up. I can already tell that I'm gonna have to do a silent fan mod on this machine. You can tell it's like quite loud. If we take a look over here, you can see this is a nozzle replacement. It looks like we've got a PTFE lined heat break. And yep, it looks like a volcano style nozzle. <laughs> looks like I got a little loose piece of brass up here. That's not gonna be good. Um, let me just take care of that. Bed leveling is all done. Overall, the variance is within a millimeter for pretty much the entire bed. That's actually pretty impressive. This is nice and level from the factory. The CR Touch should be able to compensate for any variation that we have here. Let's print out the rabbit. It's gonna take two hours. Now, one of the funny things about machines like this is pretty much all 3D printer manufacturers always ship their printers with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, which is really small for a machine this big. You could do an incredibly detailed print using a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and filling up this entire build volume, but that would take like a week. Just a little bit of a spoiler alert, I'm definitely gonna be upgrading this hot end. But first we gotta test this out in its stock configuration. See how Creality intended you to use this machine. So we'll see how it goes. Their progress menu shows the bunny being printed. So it like starts out and it's like halfway through and you see it moving up through the print. And it looks like it finished in an hour and 12 minutes. So here's our bunny print. It turned out pretty nice. Not a whole lot bad to say about this thing. We'll be doing a couple more quality tests. This is based on an older version of Kira by the looks of it, and it's pretty slow. It's really kind of deceiving how large this thing is. On the screen, it might not look that big, but 
man, like this is a helmet. I have a big head and you can see the helmet it just takes up a corner of this print volume. You could probably figure out a way to fit three or four helmets on here. So we'll go ahead and get this print started. This is a standard calibration print that I've done on a lot of other printers. The only difference is the calibration print will be two times larger on this printer just because it's a big machine and it's designed to make big prints. So I'm curious to see how the details will look on a larger model. This will be close to a 10 hour print. Overall this looks like a fantastic print. So the slicer profile that comes on Creality Slicer is quite good. I actually turned this to 200% speed. You can see the bridging performance and the overhang performance is quite excellent. It easily handles overhangs up to 70 degrees without any issue. So the new cooling duct that they've provided on this machine works quite well. This is just a great result overall. Since this machine uses the Sprite extruder that's found on so many of Creality's other printers, I'm not surprised that the print quality ended up so nice. All right, next up, I'm gonna do an insane stress test. So I'm gonna be printing out 750 of these little spacer pieces. It only took about 20 minutes to slice. And uh, just to make sure that they have the best chance of success, I'm going to clean off that bed a little bit. Normally I don't baby my printers like this. While this machine does come in at a pretty high price, if it can print reliably this large of print jobs, I think it just might be worth it. So that didn't work out very well. Let's look at the bed adhesion across the build plate. It's pretty good up here, all along this right edge, not very good. All right, so we got some filament coming out the back side of the hot end. It just filled up the silicone sock. All right, so here's the issue. This thing just kind of backfed into itself. It really doesn't look like the leak was coming from the nozzle, like the tip of the nozzle. It doesn't look like there's really any plastic coming out of there. I'm guessing it was coming out of the joint in between the nozzle and the heater block. It also might have been coming out from the top here as well. Just this whole area is covered in PLA. Since I'm going to have to do some work on this hot end anyways, I think I'm just going to go ahead and do my first mod to this machine, which is going to be to install a Volcano CHT nozzle. This is a one millimeter diameter nozzle, and I'm also going to use an all metal heat break here. So these two things together should really improve the capabilities of this machine. I'll be using these handy tools from Slice Engineering. We've got our boron nitride thermal paste, and this little torque wrench that makes sure I don't over tighten this nozzle. It's important not to over tighten the nozzles because you can risk damaging them if you do. So we'll just give it a nice little click and that puts 1.5 newton meters of torque onto the nozzle. And with this quick and easy upgrade, I should have greatly increased the volumetric flow rate that I can get out of this machine. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to install one of my custom breakout boards. This allows me some more upgrade options if I want to attach more things to this hot end in the future. I've got a little cable here plugged in for the thermistor, and then I just need to wire it onto the thermistor leads that I cut off right there. Probably the better solution here would be to install a CHC hot end like this, and then I can run the wires up to the top here and plug them into my custom motherboard connections. It looks like this Volcano CHT nozzle is a little bit shorter, so I'm just shaving off a couple layers of this BL Touch spacer that Creality is using. The last issue that we're gonna have is this nozzle is a little bit too far recessed inside of this cooling duct. It just barely pokes out there, and I wanna have a little bit more clearance. So the way I'm gonna fix that is with fire. Get that all heated up. Using one of my handy steel plates, I'll just kind of push it. All right, and just like that, we were able to roughly double the amount of clearance that we have there. And uh, they changed it just enough so that this old mount won't work. I think I just have to put some spacers underneath these screws to get this to stand off a little bit further. So we'll just loosen this up. And I'm using some 14 millimeter bolts and eight millimeter spacers. And I think that'll be just right. Now to make some extra clearance, I've removed the little arms from my breakout board. All right, and just like that, we've installed the modder board. So I've got all these extra upgrade slots in case I wanna do some upgrades on this machine. 
Oh dear, that's loud. Oh no. <laughs> I do not understand why they use such cheap fans on these things. It's just like, geez, throw a $8 Noctua fan on there or something. It'd really help quiet things down quite a bit. I'm gonna preheat to PLA temperatures and I'll be right back. I'm just gonna re-slice that entire project. All right, so now I'm using Prusa Slicer. They have a handy feature called Fill Bed with Instances. So it'll just automatically fill the entire bed. I'll do the auto arrange function, which should kind of center everything in the middle of the bed. There we go. And it's only gonna take eight hours to print all of these things. So that's 1,170 of these little spacer things. Now, one thing I did previously that may have not been a good idea was using some alcohol, you know, some drinking alcohol or whiskey to uh, clean off the bed. That might have been a bad idea because it's not pure alcohol. There might be some dissolved oils and whatnot from the oak barrels that it's distilled in. It's really not a good idea to use anything other than like a pure isopropyl alcohol to clean your bed off. So to help get rid of any oils that I might have introduced to the bed, I'm gonna be using some lens cleaning wipes. These are specifically designed to get rid of oily residues on glass. The bed adhesion seems a lot better this time around, so I'm pretty sure using uh, high-grade whiskey is not a good idea for cleaning the beds. I'm quite certain there's a little bit of some kind of oil or something that got into the bed and just ruined all the bed adhesion. That said, the issues that I had with the whole sock being filled up with plastic, that was probably from some kind of issue with the hot end not being hot tightened. Give yourself a little peace of mind by doing a hot tightening as soon as you get this machine up and running. Of course, you can do what I did and just completely change out the hot end to something more to your liking. In this case, I put a Volcano CHT nozzle with a one millimeter diameter. This is how I would have this machine set up if I was using it in a production environment. So we'll give it a fair shot the way that I would foresee myself using this machine. All right, I think I've seen enough here. I'm just gonna go ahead and stop this print. I would say this is a success. We've printed over a thousand individual pieces here and not a single one of them has come loose. So that means the combination of the bed leveling mesh, the nozzle size, the layer heights, and all of the parameters are coming together to just make a really reliable printer. Okay, so let's see how hard it is to get all of these little bits and pieces off of the build tray. <laughs> uh, that's pretty satisfying. Well, um, I'd say that's a successful print. When I first saw this print surface, I was getting ready to complain about it. But if you take a closer look, you'll notice that the print surface on the CRM4 is a lot smoother than the print surface that comes on the Ender 3S1. This one is super rough and textured, so it really grabs onto those prints, and I had a hard time getting any of my prints to come off of the plate. However, on the CRM4, they've done some kind of revision to this print surface. So the parts come off nice and clean. So props to Creality for finally figuring out the right formulation for these polycarbonate sheets. This one seems to work quite well. So after using this printer for a couple of days, I think I'm ready to go over my pros and cons of this machine. Let's start with the pros. It's really important for any printer over the $300 price mark to have excellent print quality. And I'm glad to report that the CRM4 delivers in this regard. Our print quality test turned out looking fantastic. All of the overhangs look very good, all the way up to 75 degrees. And it's not just the overhangs that are good. Also, these retraction towers show no stringing in between the towers, and our bridging tests turned out very nice as well. So overall, I'm gonna give an A plus to this printer in terms of print quality. The Y-axis motion system is quite good. It's very sturdy and you can't wiggle it even a little bit from side to side. This thing is gonna hold your prints in place very well, even as it's moving this massive bed back and forth. Also, it was quite flat from the factory. It only had a variance of about one millimeter from corner to corner. This whole gantry system is quite sturdy, and its construction is pretty typical of machines in this size range. I really like this new fan duct that they're using. I also like how this is designed around a volcano style nozzle. Having that extra melt zone is gonna be really useful when you're printing large objects at high volumetric flow rates. 
These cable chains are pretty much mandatory when you have a printer this large because without the cable chains to control the wires, they would be drooping down and they might be interfering with your prints. An added benefit of this cable chain is that it's controlling the flexing of these wires. So I imagine you'll get better longevity out of these cables because they're not bending and being creased with tight bend radiuses. One of my favorite things about this printer is all of the common parts that it shares with the rest of the Ender lineup. So I'm able to use my custom breakout board that gives me more modding options. If the extruder and hot end ever goes out, you can just purchase a Sprite hot end to replace it. Also, a lot of the aftermarket mods that were developed for the Ender 3S1 and the Ender 5S1 will also be applicable to this machine. Overall, this machine is designed and built with pretty commonly found hardware. Despite all the good things I have to say about this machine, there are some downsides to it. Number one is the price. The MSRP is $1,099 which is pretty steep for a machine that's basically just an oversized Ender 3. I think for the right person, this machine is totally worth it. If you've got a print farm where you're used to using Ender 3s, then upgrading to this will have little to no downtime in terms of workflow. You already know how most of this stuff works, and it simply lets you print larger objects or more objects at a time. I also don't like the fan noise on this machine. I think it's quite loud. It almost sounds like there's a tiny little lawnmower inside of this thing when that power supply fan kicks on. One of the other downsides of this printer is that it's using a Volcano hot end with a PTFE lined heat break. That means you're not going to want to push this over 240 degrees Celsius, otherwise that PTFE lining will start to break down. It's a little disappointing to see that they're advertising this as a 300 Celsius machine when they're shipping it with a heat break that would break down at those temperatures. Personally, I don't see why everyone hates on Delrin wheels. They're quite reliable, they're very quiet, and they're one of the cheapest ways to get the job done. However, I totally get that some people would like to see more linear rails on machines like this. Having an all linear rail machine would 100% justify the price tag, but since they're using Delrin wheels, it feels like they've cheaped out a little bit on this design. There are some minor nitpicks that I can do in terms of the belt system in the back. In my opinion, it's not perfectly assembled, but for this application, it's good enough, and it certainly seems to be getting the job done. Everybody hates bed slingers for some reason. They're not cool anymore. Everybody wants a enclosed microwave style printer. But I gotta tell you, bed slingers are fine. Uh, bed slinger is just a slang term for a printer where the print bed moves back and forth. There are inherent limitations to using a bed slinger like this. This bed is pretty heavy, so you're not gonna be able to get really fast accelerations moving this back and forth. As long as you understand those limitations and you work around them, it's really not gonna have that much of an impact on how you use this thing. I think the main reason to use a Core XY machine is if you wanna have those really high accelerations, which to me, I don't really see the point. I haven't gone over the Wi-Fi and network capabilities of this machine because I didn't get any instructions on how to use those. This printer isn't compatible with the Sonic Pad at the moment. They just haven't got around to making the profile for it. But Creality has told me that they're working on setting up the printer profiles. So in the future, you'll be able to run a Sonic Pad on this machine. Also, I've got this. It's still in the bag right now. That's five kilograms. So we've definitely got some exciting stuff coming up for this machine. Between that massive five kilogram spool of filament, the silent fan mods that we'll be doing, and possibly Clipper in the future. So make sure to get subscribed to the channel if you want to catch those updates. And I'll see you in the next video. Hey, freaking Blue Jays. Ah! <laughs>